The Lich King versus Scarlet. Let the blight begin. Oh, will serve me in death. Or in the room into the hallway, she grabbed fresh linens off of a cart, and then she turned back around and went back into Tatike's room, except now Tatike was not in his bed. So the nurse immediately thought, okay, well then Tatike must have gone into his bathroom because the door was shut, he must be in the bathroom. And so just kind of reflexively, the nurse walked over to Tatike's now empty bed and replaced the linens. And then when she was done, she just looked at the bathroom door inside of his room, expecting Tatike to come outside any minute. But after a couple of minutes passed and Tatike had still not come out of the bathroom, the nurse decided to go over and just knock. And so she walked over, she knocked on the bathroom door and just kind of called out, hey, is everything okay in there? But there was no answer. And so the nurse eventually just tried the handle and when she saw it was open, she called out that she was coming inside. She opened up the bathroom door and it was empty. And so the nurse, she whipped her head around and looked back out at the room where Tatike should have been. And she saw, you know, he's not on the bed, he's not under the bed, he's not anywhere in this room. Where could he have possibly gone? And she's thinking to herself, the only door out of this room is into the hallway, the same door that she had used to go out and get the linens. And if somehow Tatike had ran out of that door in the few seconds that her back was turned from Tatike, she certainly would have heard him or seen him. Because again, then she was right outside the door and only outside of his room for a couple of seconds. Not to mention the fact, Tatike has major incisions on his stomach and could barely stand, let alone walk or run. And so totally baffled, this nurse ultimately left the room and went and told her superiors. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring today's video. In 2017, I left the military and pretty much right away, I fell apart. The military had provided a lot of structure in my life, and so suddenly not having that structure made me feel like I was lost. Pretty soon, I began resenting all the people around me just because they seemed happy and I wasn't. I sort of figured that these feelings of resentment and unhappiness would just kind of go away on their own, but they didn't. Eventually, with some encouragement from my family and my friends, I sought out a therapist. And quickly, my therapist diagnosed me with depression, something I really did not think I was. But after the shock of the diagnosis had worn off, me and my therapist were able to kind of go back in my life and figure out what was causing me to feel the way I was feeling. And before long, having that perspective really made me feel a lot better. Look, therapy is not for everyone, but it is a great starting point for people who just kind of feel lost and don't really know where to go. And so if that's you, I would highly suggest you give BetterHelp a try. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service and it's 100% online. Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and then you can communicate with your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether that's text messaging, phone call, video call, chat, whatever you want. You can also switch therapists at any time for free. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash MrBallin. I've also linked them in the description below. This hospital would immediately begin looking for TK on the grounds of the hospital, but they would do it kind of quietly. They wouldn't call to TK's family to tell them that, hey, we can't find him, nor would they call police. And some have speculated that either one, the hospital did not think this was an emergency and they would quickly find to TK and that everything would be fine. Or two, the hospital was just so embarrassed at the idea that they lost a patient, they didn't want anyone to know. And so that's why they didn't tell anyone. Regardless, the hospital would search for Tatike all day on the 5th, the day he went missing, and they wouldn't find him. And then the next day, the 6th, the hospital again would spend the entire day quietly searching everywhere in the hospital, 
but they wouldn't find him again. And so finally on the next day, the 7th, so 48 hours after Tatike had kind of vanished inside of his room, the hospital would reach out to Tatike's family and they would say to them, hey, uh, is Tatike home with you guys? And the family was like, no, he's supposed to be with you. And so the hospital would say, well, you know, he left two days ago, so we don't know where he is. And so Tatike's family is horrified, not only that they were totally left in the dark, but they would find out over the course of this conversation that the hospital had not even contacted the police yet. And so the family, they reached out to the police, and then later that day, the family would meet the police at the Stellenbosch Hospital, and then a very public search of the property would ensue to look for Tatike. However, again, no one could find him. Authorities would continue to search both the hospital and also the neighboring area outside of the hospital over the next couple of days. But after they continued to find absolutely nothing, the search began to wind down. And so Tatike's devastated family was left with absolutely no idea what to think or what to do. Fast forward to October 20th, so 15 days after Tatike had gone missing. And on this day, the 20th, there was a construction crew at this hospital in Stellenbosch doing some renovations. And at some point on this day, one of the workers had to climb into the ceiling of one of the floors of this hospital. Now, the space above the ceiling is this tight, cramped space, almost like an attic. It's very big and wide. It's like the whole length of that floor. And really the only people that would ever go into the ceiling are construction workers or other authorized personnel that needed to do work. It's not a place that the public would ever go into. But when one of these workers went up into the ceiling, he had a headlamp on, and he's kind of looking around, he's looking for what he needs to do up there, and at some point he turns his head, and this light illuminates a person sitting in the corner far away from him, way up against the side in this tiny little attic space. And it would turn out, it was Tatike, and he was deceased. The hospital had absolutely no clue how Tatike could have gotten up there. Not only is it obviously not a publicly accessible area, but the actual way to get up into the ceiling, the door that leads up into the ceiling, is very difficult to find. And even if Tatike found this entrance into the ceiling, it would have been nearly impossible for him to actually get into the ceiling. Because again, this guy has serious incisions on his stomach from the surgery he got. He could barely sit up, he couldn't really walk. So the idea of him climbing and pulling himself up into the ceiling just seems impossible. Then there was the very strange autopsy results. Now the full report has not been made public, but Tatike's family had a consultation with the hospital after the autopsy was complete, and they would go to reporters and talk about what the hospital told them. And apparently, the hospital told the family that Tatike did not die from complications from his surgery, and they heavily insinuated that Tatike did not die from natural causes. Something happened to him, and the hospital had no idea what this something was, and that's what killed him. And the hospital also told the family that Tatike likely was dead before he went up into the ceiling. Meaning someone or something killed Tatike, and then someone or something placed him in the ceiling. Again, this is just from the family going to reporters and talking about their discussion with the hospital. The hospital's only official statement has basically been that they have cooperated with the family and they don't really know what happened to Tatike. Now, of course, this is a very strange story, but it gets even weirder. On May 10th, 2019, so about a year and a half after Tatike was found deceased in the Stellenbosch hospital ceiling, a 53-year-old father of four named Sandil Sabia arrived at another hospital in South Africa. It was in a city called Durban, which is considered to be one of the nicest and wealthiest places in South Africa, similar to Stellenbosch. Sandil was a builder, and he had been working on a house when he had fallen and broken his leg. Specifically, he broke his femur bone the bone that runs from your hip down to your knee, the big single bone in your thigh. So just for reference, if you break your femur, you can't walk. So with some assistance from friends and family, Sandil hobbled his way into this hospital in Durban and he began to receive care. 
Two days later, on May 17th, Sandil was still in the hospital, still recovering from this broken femur, when his cousin came to visit him. The cousin said Sandil seemed totally normal, and that during this visit, Sandil told the cousin that after the cousin left, Sandil was going to be transported from this hospital to another hospital nearby, where he was going to get an x-ray of his leg, as well as talk to another orthopedic surgeon. But apparently, after this cousin left from this visit, the doctors at the Durban hospital walked into Sandil's room to take him and transport him to this other hospital hospital and Sandil was not in his room. Now, this hospital in Durban was known for their very tight security, and so right away, their reaction was very different than the Stellenbosch Hospital's reaction. This hospital immediately contacted authorities and said, we are missing a patient, and they began a very public search of their hospital for Sandil, but they couldn't find it. On May 18th, so six days after Sandil disappeared, the hospital in Durban began to smell this horrible stench coming from one wing of their hospital. And so hospital workers would track the stench to a janitor's closet, and when they opened it up, they saw this black liquid dripping out of the ceiling, and the liquid was coming from Sandil's decomposing body that was located in the ceiling. Sandil's autopsy would be carried out very quickly. However, the results of that autopsy have never been made public, and Sandil's family has not commented on the results of this autopsy. As of today, all we know is that within a two-year period, two seemingly ordinary South African men, who both could either not walk at all or who could barely walk because of their physical injuries, somehow snuck out of their hospital rooms totally undetected by staff and then wound up dead in the hospital ceiling. Some say the men really did somehow sneak out of their own accord and decided to go into the ceiling and that's what happened. Others say both men were murdered and then placed into the ceiling. And still others think these two cases are the best examples of something called spontaneous teleportation, which is the hypothetical phenomenon where a human suddenly disappears and then almost instantaneously reappears in another location. But for now, there is no official explanation, so those are all just theories. And so it's up to you to decide what you believe. So that's gonna do it. If you got something out of today's story and you haven't done this already, please put coyote urine in the like button's apple juice. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. We have a podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast that puts out brand new podcast exclusive stories on Monday mornings. And on Thursday mornings, we upload remastered audio of our best YouTube videos. Again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast and it is available exclusively on Amazon Music. Consider donating to our charity called the Mr. Ballin Foundation. It provides support to victims of violent crime as well as their families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Go to mrballin.foundation and click on Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. We have two additional YouTube channels. One is called Mr. Ballin Shorts. The other is called Mr. Ballin and Espanol. We post near daily content on Facebook, Snapchat, and TikTok. TikTok. All of those pages are just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Check out our merch at shopmrballin.com, and if you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, other YouTube channels, the podcast, wherever, just know that I really appreciate your support, and until next time, that's going to do it. See ya. 纸包美味，酱香浓郁，必胜客力霸独小盒，纸包饭新口味上市。In order to appreciate today's story, I actually have to give something away right now. And that is, the main character survives. The reason I have to tell you that is because during this story, there is a really intense event that happens. And I use really specific descriptions for how something looked, how something felt, how something smelled. And if you didn't know, I was pulling that from the survivor who lived to tell the tale. You might think I was just making it up, but I'm not. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. 
So, if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button asks you to pick up some cereal for them, say yes and then go to the store and buy the big single biscuit shredded wheat cereal. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. On July 19th, 2013, 49-year-old Matt Dyer climbed on board a tiny 19-seat twin otter airplane that was parked on the tarmac of the Montreal International Airport in Canada. Matt was about to take off on the first of two flights that would take him and seven other adventurous people deep into one of the most remote and wild regions in North America. For Matt, this trip was going to be the most amazing journey of his life. He had seen the ad for this two week long expedition about a year earlier when he was looking through a magazine put out by an environmental organization called the Sierra Club. Now, even though Matt was a lawyer, he didn't make much money. He lived in this tiny town in central Maine where he made a living by offering either free or very low cost legal assistance for some of the state's poorest residents. But Matt was an avid outdoorsman. And when he saw the opportunity to explore one of Canada's newest national parks that was so far north, it was practically in the Arctic Circle, he decided the hefty $6,000 price tag was well worth it. Two and a half hours later, after flying over 900 miles due north away from the airport in Montreal, the twin otter airplane that Matt and the others were riding on touched down on a narrow gravel landing strip situated between this huge forest on the mountainside and a river on the other side. After climbing off the plane with all of their equipment, Matt and the seven others hustled their way over to the stretch of flimsy plywood buildings that lined the runway. These buildings and this entire area they were in was not a part of this new national park they were going to. This was like their staging area to prepare and get ready before catching another flight that would bring them into the park. And so Matt and the seven other people he was with, which included the two trip leaders from the Sierra Club, they would stay at this temporary base camp for the next couple of days, going over their hiking routes and talking about emergency procedures and protocols. And then after those two days were up, the group felt like they were ready. And so the group packed up all their things and they boarded the tiny float plane out on the water that would take them to their final destination, this new Canadian national park better known as the Torngat Mountains. 45 minutes later, the pilot of the float plane began to descend through the clouds to make their landing on a little water inlet. And as the pilot did that, Matt and the seven others were able to look out the window and actually see the Torngat Mountains for the first time. Now, all of them had seen dozens and dozens of pictures of this area, but seeing it for the first time in person was still shocking. The area looks like an alien planet. The wilderness in and around the Torngats is not the same kind of wilderness we think of when we think about going hiking in the forest or going camping or something. No, the wilderness in the Torngats is primordial. It's like you're looking out at a place from the very beginning of time, like dinosaurs should be walking around this area. As far as Matt could see, in any direction were these huge, jagged mountains that had been carved out of the earth by glaciers hundreds of thousands of years ago. And those same glaciers had created hundreds of waterways between the mountains called fjords that almost looked like blue-veined fingers. And even from high up in the plain, Matt could look down and the water of these fjords were so clear that he could see these speckled backs of brown trout swimming beneath the surface. But while this landscape was undoubtedly spectacularly beautiful and pristine and totally incredible, it was equal parts unwelcoming to people. There are no roads in the Torngats, there's no campsites, there's no facilities, there's no internet, there's no cell phone, and the weather is unbelievably harsh. It's freezing cold and wet most of the time, and then even when it's a little bit warm and a little bit nice there, the weather can change in an instant and become freezing cold and wet all over again. And so, as such, the handful of visitors that go into this area every year are expected to be 100% self-reliant because this really is one of the most dangerous wild regions in the world. 
But for Matt, as he looked out his window and surveyed this landscape, he wasn't second guessing his decision to go into this hostile environment, no. I mean, the reason he was willing to fork over all that money to go on this trip is because he really wanted to experience extreme wilderness firsthand. And so finally, the pilot of the float plane came into land on this little water inlet, and then the pilot ferried the craft over to this beach, and then Matt and the seven others piled off onto land with all of their things, and then as the pilot turned around and left, the two Sierra Club trip leaders, a 61-year-old man named Rich Gross and a 60-year-old woman named Marta Chase, told the group to pick up their things and follow them. And so Rich and Marta led the hikers about 500 feet away from where they had just been dropped off up to this slightly elevated, mostly flat area that kind of overlooked the fjord and had this incredible view of all the mountains around them. Now, unlike the temporary base camp they had been at for the past couple of days, this camp was nowhere near any forests. They were basically on a wide open plain that kind of went right up into these mountains. So it's very wide open where they're staying. And so after Rich and Marta instructed the group where to set up their tents, Matt and the others got to doing that. And then after they were all set up, Rich and Marta put a small electric fence around the perimeter of their tents to keep any nosy animals out. And then the group headed up a little bit higher on this mountain near them to take their first group photo. And in this photo, they all look so happy and so excited for what's to come. And over the next couple of days, their trip would go exactly to plan. During the daytime hours, they would hike all of their pre-planned hiking routes all over the mountains and down near the water. And at night, they would eat their food and drink fresh water from the fjord and swap stories from back home. But their perfect trip was about to become a nightmare. I've been married to my wife, Amanda, for nearly 12 years, and I just love her so much. She's so thoughtful, so kind, an amazing mother. And so this Christmas, I wanted to get her something extra special to show her how much I care. And what's more special than a pet middle-aged rabid skunk? And so me and old Lungy hopped on my nuclear-powered laptop and began slapping away at the keys to navigate to an online vendor that sold rab skunks. But as soon as I clicked on the link, www we sell rabbit skunks and also pudding.com, I knew I had made a terrible mistake. That website was riddled with malware, and so immediately my laptop began to melt down and literally exploded. Luckily, oh, why? shielded me from the blast, and then after the nuclear winter had subsided, oh, why? put on. <laughs> And then after the nuclear winter had subsided, Lungi put on his traditional gakti and he said, Lopeta Uden Drayekeshen, Ayutaninen, Rokeshta Roidi Nord VPNLE. Which of course in Finnish means stop causing nuclear explosions. Sign up for NordVPN. A VPN or virtual private network is a service that keeps you safe while you browse the internet. And NordVPN is the brand name in the space. Not only will NordVPN keep all of your information safely behind their wall of next generation encryption, but also, most importantly, they will block malware hosting websites along with annoying ads and botnet control. So if you're tired of your Christmas shopping turning into nuclear explosions, then take Lungi's advice